almost kill him once in a near accident in Flagstaff, Arizona, when we were at a conference a long, long time ago. I remember that. You, maybe I don't know. remember that. Oh, <laughs> it was so scary, he brought it out of his mind. So he's going to talk about ages of stellar property, know your star, know your place. Hi, right, thanks, Rich. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, sort of a broad overview on stellar ages and properties. Um, and I, I'd like to, I'll, I'll probably have sort of an extended uh, question period here. I'm just going to show some uh, uh, examples of, you know, trends that we see with stellar age that might be useful. I'm trying to think of, I was trying to think of sort of a compressed set of slides that uh, I wish I would have seen when I was trying to age date stars. Um, and uh, but unfortunately, there's just so much to cover uh, that I'm, I'm probably going to skip over a lot. Uh, I'll be uh, passing up a lot of uh, useful material on things like eclipsing binaries, which is a whole other uh, talk in itself on, in terms of calibrating uh, stellar properties uh, and ages, um, discussions on isochrones, differences in stellar models. Um, so this is going to be a pretty broad brush. If there's particular questions on types of stars or individual stars, feel free to ask me afterwards. Um, I uh, restrain myself from showing examples of horribly age-dated stars that led to horribly wrong conclusions in literature. It's not you. Um, so I, I try to keep it very broad. But if there's questions on individual stars or types of stars, feel free to, to ask. Um, so I just moved uh, to JPL uh, a little less than two years ago. I'm now Deputy Program Chief Scientist of the NASA Exoplanet Exploration Program. So if you have any questions on Exep, uh, please uh, contact me. Uh, Dave Soderbloom, uh, uh, one of our colleagues and friends at uh, Space Telescope Science Institute, wrote a very nice review on stellar ages back in 2010. Um, and uh, this was a quote he had in the, uh, in the beginning of his review that sort of motivated the subject. Uh, I'm going to stand over here and try to read it, because I can't read it from the podium. Uh, he said, someday soon we anticipate the detection of Earth-sized planets around stars. Before too long, we hope we can expect that someone will identify a sign of life, a biomarker on the Earth-like planet around another star. Given the need for high angular resolution to make that observation and the inherent cost of photons to work with, the star in question will be one close to us, which is to say a field star that's unassociated with the cluster. When that claim is announced, the first question we'll ask is how old is that star? Uh, so that we can assess, assess the, the planet's evolution. And that determining its age is likely to be difficult and precise and problematic in its own way because the observation is biomarker. Um, people would actually try to measure the photons from stars, uh, planets around stars, and disagree with that. Um, uh, but as you'll see in uh, some of the discussion uh, coming up, that the, the, the ages are very difficult to pin down for uh, some classes of astronomers in the neighborhood. Uh, so that was in 2010. This was uh, this was a couple years after we had a um, uh, IU Symposium 258 on the ages of stars um, in 2008, and uh, that was a very nice review of all the different techniques from the very uh, in age dating from the very youngest stars to the very oldest stars. And uh, anyway, I highly recommend uh, David's review. Um, th his question on just how much interest there was in the age of the star just came up very recently. So early in 2017, we had the announcement that of seven transiting planets orbiting the nearby uh, M dwarf uh, Trappist-1. Um, and this was on the, 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 uh, the, the above the fold in the New York Times. And there actually was a lot of interest. Um, uh, we had uh, we had a representative uh, in Congress visit JPL uh, shortly after the discovery, um, and he was very interested in the discovery. And the first question he had was, well, "How old the system?" And nobody knew. <laughs> um, and so there was there's interest from the public, not just from astronomers. Um, and some of the early uh, quotes on the age. Uh, were simply wrong. Uh, people were simply quoting how long it took. This was a very low mass star, about a tenth of the uh, mass of the sun, and uh, they take about half a billion years to reach the main sequence. So people were quoting, you know, the pre-main sequence contraction time scale of half a billion years. Well, that's not right. That's um, that's simply a, 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 a lower limit given how long it takes to reach the main sequence, and the star is squarely on the main sequence. Um, so after this this uh, question came out. Um, uh, I got on the horn with Adam Bergasser at, at UC San Diego, and I said, we should really do a paper just on the age of Trappist-1 um, and do the best we can. And M dwarfs are hard. Um, uh, there's not a lot of useful uh, age indicators for them. And at the end of the day, what we were stuck with, most of the constraint is actually from the kinematics of the star. 
uh, the stars, either an old thin disk star or, an old, uh, or a thick disk star. It's, it's clearly older than the sun, uh, but doesn't seem to be uh, older than about nine or 10 giga years. And so literally the best we could do was about, we quoted 7.6 plus or minus 2.2 giga years. Um, that's about the best you can do for a lot of the nearby uh, M dwarfs. This was, this was throwing the kitchen sink at the star. And for these M dwarfs, uh, once they reach the main sequence, you think, oh, I can use isochrones, right? We, we uh, astronomers have developed stellar interiors models, atmospheres models. They've evolved them in time, taking into account nuclear synthesis. So we have stellar evolutionary tracks. We stitch together those theoretical stellar evolutionary tracks and we create isochrones and we plot isochrones with stellar properties like temperature, uh, uh, stellar, uh, sorry, uh, effective temperature, luminosity. Sometimes we transfer, transform them into things like absolute magnitude and colors. And uh, the problem with, with the very low mass stars is they don't evolve very quickly. Um, so the, in fact, the, the HR diagram position, the, you know, the color magnitude position, temperature luminosity position for a star like Trappist one is mainly an indicator of metallicity. That's the main, that's the main spread in the, the main sequence because the, the, the star will probably last for about a trillion years on the main sequence. Okay. So uh, anyway, this was this was a this was a fun example of a uh, a star of a lot of interest that we threw the kitchen sink at to try to uh, age date. Um, so uh, my one of my a lot of my early interest is in, in uh, stellar ages and early stellar evolution. Um, so I've looked at a lot of topics in stellar ages and written papers on um, some of the stellar age indicators uh, for the last uh, two decades. Um, and so um, now I'm uh, in the NASA Exoplanet Exploration uh, Program Office. I'm mainly interested in, in exoplanets and try to advance uh, exoplanet science for, for the U.S. community within NASA. Um, but we're interested in characterizing, discovering planets around other stars, characterizing their properties, identifying candidates that, that harbor life. So stellar ages are still a hot topic, uh, and stellar parameters are, are a hot topic um, because you only know your planet as well as you know your star. Um, and if you look at the, 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 the focus of the different subfields within NASA, this is, uh, is within NASA astrophysics. This is sort of the, uh, how NASA astrophysics is now split after the 2010 decadal. Um, there's the you know, physics of the cosmos, cosmic origins, and the uh, exoplanet exploration program is sort of split by the big questions. But you'll see things like, you know, we want to understand the formation um, uh, of stars and planetary systems. We want to understand evolution. And so we want to attach ages to, to, these, um, uh, to these planetary systems. But throughout astrophysics, we're, 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 interested, in, uh, we're interested in ages. Um, and the importance of stellar parameters is, this is just to emphasize, so from the recent Kepler mission, uh, we really need to know the stars well, right? So here's some of the general conclusions from the Kepler mission. Planets are everywhere. The small planets seem to be the most common type in the galaxies. The sub-Neptunes and the super-Earth seem to be the most common type we've seen so far. Um, and those are, those are defined in, in radius bins. And we're, we're also trying to count how many Earth-sized planets there are within the habitable zones uh, of, uh, of stars. And so we need, to, we need to understand the star very well. We're trying to measure the radius of the planet. Uh, we'd like to know how far the planet is from its star. We'd like to know how, uh, how much radiation the planet is, is getting from its star. So we need to know the stars very well. Um, this is another plot just summarizing some of the, the, the hab zone rocky planets uh, from Kepler. But, uh, whoops, sorry. Um, you'll see the uh, axes. We've got surface temperature. So what type of star are we talking about for these rocky planets? We're going from uh, the uh, cool M dwarfs down here through the K dwarfs through the G and light F uh, uh, main sequence dwarf stars. And, uh, you know, we're looking, for, we're, we're looking for planets that are uh, receiving about as much energy as the, uh, as the Earth. These will be of keen astrobiological interest in the future, and we hope to find more of these among brighter stars um, uh, in the near future and characterize them with telescopes like uh, James Webb and, uh, and future space observatories. Um, and in terms of uh, characterizing the stellar radii, the better you know the stellar radius, the better you know the planetary radius. Okay, so when you see plots like this, this is some work by the uh, ExoPag, uh, the, the uh, uh, science analysis group uh, within the, uh, 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 the ExoPag. This was a community effort to try to constrain the, the frequency of planets as a function of radius and their, and their distance from their star. Um, there's a special zone here that looks like Nevada, uh, defining the Earth-like planets. 
Um, just in the, in the recent concept studies for the large missions like Habex and Louvoir, people started to bin the planets in these radius bins. Um, they didn't call these Earth-like because you don't want to call something that's getting a thousand times the radiation of the Earth an Earth-like planet. Uh, but we'll just call these rocky. So far, they all seem to be, their densities are all consistent with rocky. Things larger than Earth to about 1.75, this gap between the sub-Neptune and sub-Earths. Um, these things probably have hydrogen at rich atmospheres above 1.75. These probably have hydrogen poor atmospheres. Um, and uh, there's this region in the habitable zone. This is the so-called cosmic shoreline, which is defining the, uh, uh, the southwest uh, border there of the Exo Nevada. Um, basically, the close-in the close-in planets probably uh, need to be a bit uh, more massive to retain their atmospheres. So anyway, this is this this all relies very um, uh, strongly on characterizing the stars, right? If you want to know the stellar, uh, sorry, if you want to know the, know the planet radii, you need to know the stellar radii as accurately as you can. The, the transits from Kepler at K2 and now TESS are measuring, you know, the fraction of the air, the, uh, the star's area that's being blotted out by the planet. That goes as the, the ratio of the radii of the planet to the star squared. Um, and to get semi-major axis, we need to know the stellar masses. Um, and uh, the transits uh, are giving us the orbital periods, and those translate into semi-major axis. Once you have the luminosity of the star, you can, you can calculate how much radiation uh, the, the planet is receiving. Okay, so both axes, this is, this is a very important plot, just trying to constrain what are the demographics of exoplanets, what are the frequency of exoplanets similar to Earth. Um, this, this, the exo, whoops, sorry, the exo Nevada shape here is of keen interest to, uh, for designing future missions, because uh, we need to know how, um, how large of a telescope in space do you need if you want to if you want to image uh, uh, Earth-like planets around nearby stars? Okay, this is a uh, this is a summary from uh, Dave Sutterbloom's review. This is just showing a couple of, uh, uh, a few of the, the, the main stellar age indicators. I'm just going to briefly talk about these. Uh, I apologize if you're in the back of the room. But he uh, created sort of a scaling in the different types of the age indicators. He goes from the semi-fundamental age indicator to model dependent to empirical. The semi-fundamental, these are the ones that have the, the fewest assumptions going into them. Ideally, um, those, are, those, are the, those are the ones that you would sort of use as the benchmark ages, the most simply understood physics um, that can provide the most accurate, uh, most accurate ages. Uh, we have several model dependent uh, uh, age indicators. And these, we need to understand the stellar interiors and, and stellar evolution very, very well uh, for all three of those. Uh, and then there's the empirical age indicators. These are where we see trends of some indicator versus age, and that age usually comes from some other set of uh, stellar uh, age indicators, but they're more fundamental stellar age indicators. So there's sort of a hierarchy in these different age indicators. Um, and just because you measure one, if you have some empirical relation, you know, activity with age, and you measure it very, very precisely, that doesn't mean you can measure the aging very, very precisely, because these empirical age indicators are fundamentally dependent on either the model dependent age indicators or the semi fundamental age indicators. Okay? So if you measure the rotation period of a star to, you know, one second accuracy, and you use these calibrations, you're not going to measure the age of the star to, uh, to, to you know, several figures, because there's, there'll be, there will be systematic in those age indicators. So let's talk about a few of these. So the semi-fundamental age indicators, we've got nucleocosmic chronometry and, and kinematics. And the way he has this table, he has I is referring to individual stars, E is for ensemble. So think clusters, associations, and in some, in, the, uh, in some cases, just the aggregate properties of, of field stars in the solar neighborhood. Um, and he sort of ranks them by lower, lower cases and higher cases. So if you see something that's like red in, in the upper case, that's sort of the sweet spot for where these are most useful. We split these by pre-main sequence stars, zero age main sequence stars, main sequence stars, and populations to you know, ancient stars, like the uh, old field halo stars, globular clusters in the solar neighborhood. Pre-main sequence stars, depending on mass, tend to be sort of tens of millions of years old or less. Zero age main sequence, this is one of those really silly pieces of astronomical nomenclature that stuck around for a long time. The zero age main sequence does not define T equals zero for the ages of stars. This is an unfortunate uh, carryover from the mid 20th century. It's just where the, where the stars reach the main sequence. And you can, there's different ways to define that, probably by minimum radius or where stellar nucleus synthesis becomes the dominant uh, uh, energy, uh, means of energy production over uh, gravitational contraction. 
So uh, for the sun, for one solar mass star, the pre-main sequence phase is less than 40 million years old. The zero age main sequence would be around 40 million years. Um, main sequence will be the next 10 billion years, and population two stars is less than 10 to 13 billion year old stars uh, in our Milky Way. So the two fundamental ones, you've got nuclear cosmochronometry chronometry and kinematics. Both of these are really problematic. You would love these to work all the time for every star that they don't, okay? Nucleocosmochronometry is trying to measure the decay of uranium and thorium in stellar atmospheres for which we have accurate decay time constants. The problem is uranium and thorium are really rare, okay? Fortunately, they're rare on Earth. That's the bad part. Uh, but they're also rare in stellar atmospheres, and they're completely swamped by iron lines. Okay, if you look at the spectrum of a typical FGK star in solar neighborhood, you're, you've got tons and tons of iron lines, and they just cover everything. Um, and so these are very, very, the, the lines where you can measure these uh, radioactive, uh, uh, these, uh, these, these elements that are decaying, um, they're, they tend to be very, very weak. And so you can only really measure them well in very, very metal poor stars where the forest of iron lines has sort of cleared up. So there aren't many stars where nucleocosmochronometry has been used, and typically, you know, somebody will get a wonderful, very high resolution, very high signal noise spectrum of a very, very, very metal poor star. They'll measure these tiny little lines, they'll apply the, the nuclear decay constant, and they'll get an age for the star like eh, nine plus or minus three giga years. Okay. So if you know, thank you for the effort. It's a nice, you know, it's a nice confirmation of ages from other indicators. Um, but we really haven't been able to, to, to reproduce, or re haven't been able to use those ages on a, on a large scale, uh, over a large number of stars. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting work. It provides some uh, sanity check on the ages of stars, but um, it has limited applicability for field search. So those are mainly for old main sequence stars and pop two stars, but old, you know, sort of 10 to 13 giga year old stars. Then we have kinematics on here, and there's a, there's a, there's a bright red E, okay, for pre main sequence stars. <laughs> Stars form in clusters, embedded clusters within dark molecular clouds. Those clusters seem to disperse. About 90% of those clusters disperse on time scales of about 10 million years. Um, and then a very small fraction of stars would stay in bound open clusters for a order of you know, hundreds of millions of years. And it's very rare to see open clusters that are billions of years old. Um, the unbound associations that those embedded clusters uh, dissolve into so nearby OB associations, think, think of things like SCO10, Orion OB1, Vela OB2. Um, the, the idea that's gone back uh, to about the 1950s is that you can measure the expansion of these groups quite accurately in HKT stars. Um, and this is, a, this is the, uh, the, the application of trying to measure these expansion ages has just sort of been reinvigorated with the, this the release of the guys VR2 data which is now providing you know, phenomenal distances and proper motion for the stars. So this is sort of a work in progress. I mean, up until Gaia VR2, I have, and, and I have tried this for multiple groups, I have not seen a kinematic age estimate that was useful and accurate, okay, just across the board. Um, there, are, there are quotes in the literature of these, these ages, um, uh, but you, know, you can tweak the memberships a little bit, you'll get a very different age. Some of them are measuring the expansions, expansions of entire OB associations, something that might be on the order of 100 parsecs. The stars that form in those complex typically form over 10 or 20 million years anyway. So how useful is the expansion age? So kinematics has been something, has been a technique. Uh, trying to measure the expansion of these groups has been, uh, people try tried to uh, apply this over the past decades with whatever the best astrometry was. Um, but it has been very unsuccessful, but there's been, there's been new work now on uh, young associations expanding on the guy VR2 data. Um, and uh, some of that work is done here at uh, uh, Caltech, and um, um, we'll see if there's some uh, some new uh, new interesting expansion ages that come up come from employing the Gaia data. So the model dependent data we've got isochrones, lithium depletion boundary, and astro seismology. Isochrones, uh, there's a large range of space over which you can use isochrones. So this is taking the stellar evolutionary tracks, stitching them together by age, and there's regions in the HR diagram where the stars are evolving quickly and you have a higher fidelity of trying to measure uh, uh, an isochronal age. So usually either when the star is contracting to the main sequence or when the star is leaving the main sequence. And the stars that are high mass are also, uh, they also evolve much faster 
So it's much easier to use these methods on high mass stars than low mass stars. I'm trying to measure an isochronal age from main sequence late G, K, or M type star. Good luck. You're basically, uh, even, even with the best distances, you're basically measuring uh, metallicity instead of age. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, isochrones here. But there's a wide app applicability of these, and they're, and they're most useful for ensembles. So uh, looking at star clusters where we have a wide range of um, uh, types of star from the high mass down to the low mass range, and we can catch stars in these different phases of their evolution um, when, they're, uh, when they're evolving very quickly. So for, for young groups, for example, the high mass stars may turn off the main sequence uh, by 10 million years. The pre-main sequence stars will still do that in the emission. Um, but I, the isochrones are very dependent on the physics that's going into the model, um, and those are, those are steadily improving. You can't assume the models are perfect. Okay, so if you've got your fancy pants Bayesian code that's interpolating an HR diagram point and a set of tracks, those tracks, is go put real stars on those tracks and you'll find that there's, there's, there's regions of the HR diagram where they don't do well. You know, you may catch, every M dwarf may look like a pre-made sequence star because the tracks may have left out, you know, magnetic fields, for example, in their, uh, uh, in their physics prescription. Um, and there, the, the isochrones have been steadily improving. The stellar opacities are improving. Our knowledge of the abundance of the sun, which is uh, the, 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 the distribution of chemical elements in the sun, this is still a matter of controversy of the last uh, decade, decade and a half. Um, just what exactly defines solar? Um, and uh, the tracks are also improving from including rotation, mixing, uh, different types of mixing, um, and um, uh, magnetic fields, which are apparently very important for the low mass stars. We see these kilogauss fields in the star spots that cover large fractions of the surface of low mass, uh, of low mass stars. Those, those fields are kilogauss because they're basically an equipartition with the ideal gas pressure in the atmosphere of the star. Okay? They're, a, they're an important source of pressure support. You can't ignore the magnetic field. Okay? So for decades and decades, we've ignored magnetic fields, but they are indeed important. Um, lithium depletion boundary, you see this has an E and E next to it. This is for ensembles. This is for clusters. Lithium depletion, what we do is we've got models that predict uh, how much lithium is consumed uh, in the, in, through nucleosynthesis, um, and what you can see, there's different regions of the HR diagram where this is applicable, but the lithium depletion seems to go fastest for the early M stars, right around M3. Why is that? Those are low mass, okay? The, the nucleosynthesis assume of, um, of the uh, lithium depletion uh, is a very strong function of temperature, okay? The core temperatures of the stars are very uh, sensitive function of the, the uh, uh, the mass of the star, um, and for the uh, for the mid M's, the core temperature is such that they can deplete lithium within tens of millions of years, and they're fully convective. Okay, so they drag material from the photosphere all the way into the core, and they can consume their initial abundance of lithium very quickly. If you go a little bit higher in mass, you look to the K stars and the G stars, you'd think, well, those stars have hotter interiors, so they should deplete lithium faster. The problem is. Those stars are high enough mass, they're high enough temperatures, they develop radiative interiors, and the mixing is not as efficient. So the temperature that the, the lithium is reaching that, 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 uh, hits the photo, that uh, goes to the photosphere is a lower temperature because it's, it's, a, it's a shell and the star is further out, and, and the temperature is lower, so the lithium depletion is lower. If you go further down from M3, if you go down to like M6, M7, M8, so the lithium depletion is even slower. In fact, you reach regions where the, the lithium is not depleted at all, those stars are fully convective. They're dragging the material that you see in the photosphere all the way to the core, but the temperature is not hot, high enough for the reaction. So you get sort of a sweet spot where the lithium depletion is very strong. The, the physics behind that is pretty well known. We're, we know the nuclear reaction rates. Um, the stellar models are still in a bit of a state of flux because they're now starting to include things like magnetic fields. Um, and uh, there seems to be some dependence perhaps on rotation in, in determining how much lithium depletion there is too. So for clusters that are younger than about a billion years, this has been one of the ways that we age date them. So you'll see papers on lithium depletion boundary. People are looking for the range in stellar mass and absolute magnitude where the stars either have a lot of lithium or negligible lithium, and that translates to a mass, that translates to an age where the lithium depletion is, is taking place quickly. 
So we have lithium depletion boundary agents for uh, very well studied nearby clusters like the Pleiades um, and uh, uh, the Hyades, um, IC2391, IC2602. So we have sort of a, um, um, a ladder of, of ages, if you will, for nearby well studied clusters from the uh, lithium depletion. By the way, I just noticed the clock is not working, but uh, you're up with 10.56. When are we finished up? 11.15? Okay, boy, I better move on from this one. Uh, I'll close this up, or I'll, I'll try to move a little bit faster here. Uh, astro seismology, there are, uh, you'll see studies of astro seismology in, uh, for some nearby, very bright, very well studied uh, solar type stars in, in this whole neighborhood, uh, based on Hopkins and Corey. Um, and you also see them for red giants and Kepler fields, where we can study many, many, many uh, red giants. Uh, but this is basically giving us a map of the sound speed inside of the star. That's telling us something about the pressure and density. This is the Stranger Stellar models and, and uh, infer uh, ages. There's these empirical ones, I've, and I've worked on some of these. We see empirical strength. The stars spin down as they get older, so called gyrochronology. This is basically a function of magnetic breaking in the star. Um, I'll show some slides on that. The activity of the star, the chromospheric activity, the coronal activity. Okay? These stars um, are mostly plasma in their interiors. There's convection going on, there's rotation going on, there's differential rotation going on. These conspire to uh, uh, produce a, a magnetic dynamos. Uh, the magnetic field lines uh, of magnetic fields are produced. They reconnect, they heat the atmosphere of the star, and they can heat the, the tenuous upper atmosphere very hot. We get million degree, tens of millions of degrees coroning, and we get these chromospheres that are sort of 10 to the 4, 10 to 5 Kelvin between the photosphere of the star and the corona. And we can see emission lines uh, from those. And so if the stars wrote to spin down as they age, we can measure uh, these, these empirical decays in the, in the activity. Um, and we can also, uh, there's also decline in lithium just empirically. We can, we can do some, uh, instead of using a whole cluster, we can try to um, uh, do it for individual members of the cluster. Okay. Um, just, uh, this just is just briefly talking about the time scale, just to get you thinking about the isochronal ages. The high mass stars evolve very quickly. So I've got, uh, this is the main sequence lifetime, I'm uh, sorry, the uh, stellar lifetime, main sequence plus main, post main sequence uh, for stars on the right. And on the left, this is the pre main sequence time scale. Okay? And I've just put one solar mass for stars like the sun. So our sun's going to live about 12 billion years, okay? about 10 or 11 billion years on the main sequence. The pre-main sequence time scale is around 40, 45 million years, okay? As soon as you start talking about very massive stars, a 10 solar mass star, like the stars you see in the belt of Orion, um, uh, those, the, those the blue uh, OB type supergiant, uh, these stars tend to last, uh, they only sort of stay on the main sequence about 10 million years, um, and they contracted the main sequence in only on the order of 100,000 years or so. They contract very quickly. And the very low mass stars, I'm talking trillions of years in their lifetime, their pre-made sequence time will exceed a billion years. Um, when we're talking about ages, um, I, some of the talks today are on direct imaging. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the young star ages. Um, if, you're, if you're studying uh, young in, inflated uh, giant planets through direct imaging uh, or in nearby star forming regions, one of the first things you look at is the, is the kinematics. This is looking at the UV, uh, 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 the U and V velocity components uh, for nearby young stars. U is the direction of the galactic center. V is in the galactic direction of galactic rotation. The local standard of rest is here. These are the names of some of the nearby young associations. A lot of these are clouds that are still forming stars, like Ophiuchus, Corona Australis, Lupus, Serpens, uh, Taurus, the Pipe Nebula. They tend to have velocities within about five or 10 kilometers a second of the local standard of rest. Local standard of rest is just a circular velocity around the galaxy. The gas in the galaxy that's forming the star, it tends to move across the circle, okay? The stars that form out of those clouds, once they're decoupled from the gas, they're subject to perturbations from the galaxy by spiral arms and the galactic bar. And they start jarring the velocities and they start randomizing the velocities over billions of years, okay? So this is just a snapshot of some of the groups nearby that are younger than about 100 million years. And you'll see most of them are within about uh, 10 or 20 kilometers a second of local standard rest. This is basically showing that the, the gas that uh, the stars formed out of this is, is very slow moving with respect to local center rest. Um, 
Oh, Oumuamua, our interstellar visitor that came to visit us, when it came into the solar system, it was right here, um, which is interesting. It didn't have a, it doesn't seem to have a velocity which is very random compared to local field stars. Local field stars typically have velocities tens of kilometers a second off the local star rest, um, but Oumuamua had a very low velocity. Does that mean it was young? Maybe. Um, for the for kinematics, um, I recommend using the new Banyan Sigma code that Jonathan Gagne has, has developed. Um, and uh, in collaboration with, with John Malo, um, and we just had a paper come out in 2018 that, that tries to summarize the nearby groups within a, uh, 150 parsecs. But this is a nice online tool that you can enter uh, the latest greatest astrometry, which is usually from Gaia VR2, um, and it calculates uh, kinematic memberships and also takes on the top of position of the star. And we're continuing to add, there's, there's new nearby young groups being discovered all the time that are being added to this, this Bayesian membership code. Um, just want to briefly talk about activity. Okay, so this is showing activity as a function of color, B minus V, Johnson color. Our sun is right here at B minus V of 0.65. Our sun is a pretty chromospherically quiet star. It's a middle-aged old star. And this is just showing the trend in chromospheric activity. This is, this is emission in the calcium A to K line. So the calcium, um, uh, in the calcium is being excited in the upper atmosphere of the star. And this is one of the emission lines given off as that gas cools, and we can measure it in the, in the blue uh, visible part of the spectrum. It's very easy to measure, and people have been using it as an age indicator for half a century. And what you can see is SCO, these are showing the evolution and activity. SCOSEN is a nearby association around 10 to 20 million years old. Pleiades around 120 million years old. The Hyades is around 600 to 700 million years old. M67 is around 4 billion years old. Here's our sun. Our sun is the, is the star we obviously have the most accurate age for, because we actually have samples, because we have meteorites in our solar system. And the very oldest meteorites, the ages all clump up at 4,557,000,000 uh, years, plus or minus about a mega year. Okay, so we know the, we know the age of the, the, the solar system is about the four significant figure. The rest, of, you know, the rest of these stars, you're really lucky if you get to 10%. Uh, and this is just showing the median, uh, median activity trend for the local star. Um, this is showing chromospheric activity in terms of Rossby number. The Rossby number is basically parameterizing rotation. It's the rotation divided by the convective turnover time in the star. Okay. So this is one of the terms that goes into um, uh, one of the, the estimates of, of the magnetic dynamo, the production of magnetic fields uh, in the star. And so this is basically tracing rotation, but it's taking into account that the stars have a wide range of convective overturn times from the F star through the G through the K stars. Okay, so this is showing the, the log R prime HK. This is that chromospheric activity indicator. Uh, there's a regime for stars that are very fast rotating, for, for solar type stars rotating less than a few days, they tend to have very similar activity levels. There's a so called X ray saturation, there's a chromospheric activity saturation level. That's sort of where the, the stars producing enough magnetic flux has become an important con uh, con contributor to the pressure budget in the atmosphere of the star. You have a lot of star spots, you have a lot of collages. These are very active stars. You see star spots. Um, they have, their X-ray emission is about one part in a thousand of their total emission. For an old star like the sun, that number is more like one in a million, okay? So we can actually use the, the we can actually use chromospheric activity to predict rotation. Um, and we see other correlations. So this is showing coronal activity versus rotation. This is a soft X-ray flux in the, in the KEV part of the spectrum. This is the million degree gas, up to maybe 10, 10 million degree gas in the, in the tenuous corona of the star. And it also scales with Rossi number of rotation. Okay, so this is done up here. Um, and this is, a, this is a very old plot. I apologize that this is from my paper from 10 years ago. This is what the uh, um, so-called gyrochronology plot. Empirically, we see a slowdown in the spin of stars over time. They're being magnetically broken. Okay. The stars have some angle of momentum. They have a wind. There, is, there are charged particles that are traveling along these, these open magnetic field lines, and they're acting to torque down the rotation of the star. Um, and so we can see the rotation. This is color. So here's the M stars, K stars, G stars, F stars. Here's the Pleiades around 100 million years. Here's the Hyades around 60, 70 million years. Here's the sun. Here's Alpha Centauri. We've now got a lot more uh, points to put on this plot from, uh, from Kepler and other nearby star surveys, but this general trend is, is true. We're still seeing the stars are spinning down in a bunch of time. So the rotation rate itself can be a useful age indicator for the uh, solar type stars. 
there's been some controversy over the last five years. There's been some mixed results that have come from Kepler and from some of these chromospheric activity surveys. And there's been claims that chromospheric activity is not a useful age indicator for some of the sun-like stars. There's been some controversy on just how well rotation is activity uh, as an age indicator. I just wanted to point out one recent result from Lorenzo Oliveira. Um, this is for a population of 82 solar twins in the solar neighborhood. And this is measuring the chromospheric activity now as a function of age for these solar twins. The solar twins we can characterize very well. We know their, their relative abundance as compared to the sun, the relative temperatures, the relative surface gravity is very, very well. And now with, with DIA-DR2 parallaxes, we can measure the distances very precisely. So the, the, the isochronal ages for these stars are now on pretty good footing if you, uh, you calibrate them to the sun. Okay, so. The chromospheric activity is, in fact, decreasing over time, and we continue to see this into the past about seven giga years. So the sun looks very normal for its rotation, for its chromospheric activity, for its coronal activity. The sun is typical. There's nothing terribly extraordinary about it in that term. Um, this is an old plot. I was just showing lithium. This is the equivalent width of the lithium 6707 line. This is the strongest lithium line uh, in the uh, visible part of the spectrum. I don't have models on here, so these lines, unfortunately, are just are just fits to the actual data points. Um, but this is just showing us a range of different stellar populations from weak line Tetori stars, ages less than 5 million years. This is a range of young clusters, tens of millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, up to the age of M67 at 4 giga years. Uh, and our sun is not plugged on here. It's, it's lithium is, is very, very tiny. But just empirically, if you just plot out the temperature versus the strength of this line, you can convert that to a stellar abundance. Um, but this is just an, an empirical way to plot that. You see that the, the strength of these lithium lines, they go from so strong that you can see them at the telescope. You look at the spectrum and you're like, whoa, lithium, this is a young star. Um, as soon as you get the old field stars, the equivalent width of the sun around 5,800 Kelvin is like 2 million. So it's, you, you have a tough time distinguishing it from the forest of local time. So, uh, this is, so this is going from the M stars, K stars, G stars, F stars, uh, lithium is useful at least for pulling out which stars are young, okay? Um, I was gonna give a, a, I was gonna give a couple slides on this. Don't forget about spectral types. We're talking about stellar characterization. You know, uh, people take spectra now. There's, there's codes for measuring stellar parameters very accurately if you've got a good high resolution, high signal mode spectrum. Um, I would just implore you, just as a sanity check, go look at the spectral types. Um, I'm now running into stars in the Kepler, uh, from Kepler, that the temperatures seem to be off by 10%. Okay, that's inexcusable now in the 21st century. You should never be off by 10% in a temperature. Look at the look at the spectrum. Okay, so um, there are uh, just you know if you have a, a library of spectral standards of different types, they're defined by stars of a given um, um, from the different surveys that sort of define a nice grid of of uh, Spectral standards over, over the past few decades. But spectral types do not, they do not correspond to, you know, they're not just a color, they're not just an absolute magnitude or a mass, they're an actual just appearance of the spectrum. And just looking at that, okay, you give me, you give me a spectrum and I compare it to a grid of, of uh, spectral standards, I can tell you the temperature to a box plus or minus 100 Kelvin, okay, before I put it in any code um, uh, using anything more sophisticated. Um, so just why are they useful? You know, there's there, uh, uh, just a, a sandy check on the an estimate of the temperature of the star. You can't ignore redding. We need to we need to uh, be able to compare the intrinsic temperature, uh, the in, intrinsic colors of the star, to the observed colors, and try to get an estimate of the redding and the extinction. Um, so anyway, I, I'm just just in terms of trying to improve stellar radii and and, and uh, the stellar redding, which factors into the stellar luminosity, trying to improve those. Um, I would just say, um, please take a look at the spectral types of stars. Um, M dwarfs are uh, their own uh, uh, bag of problems. I'd just like to refer you to some recent work by Andrew Mann and some recent work from the PhD thesis of Elizabeth Newton on characterizing nearby M dwarfs. Um, now we're getting to the point where temperatures and uh, luminosity estimates um, and metallicity estimates for the M dwarfs are starting to become very good. So I'm just going to refer you to some of the, the recent work on. Um, on the very low mass stars from those authors. Um, back to Soderbloom. Let me, I don't have much time here. Uh, one of the questions I get a lot is, what's the age of HD blah, blah, blah? OK, 
okay, I get these emails all the time, about once a month. Somebody emails me and says, I found this thing. It's a disk, it's a planet, it's a, who knows, Dyson sphere or something. Okay, I never get that. Um, they want to know what the age of the star is, okay? What do I do? The first thing I do is I plug the, na the name of the star into Sindat and Vizier um, and just, just get a sense of the star. Is the star multiple? Is it very well studied? Um, and, and that sort of sets up the, 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 the future efforts to try to characterize it. Um, if you type into Vizier, I usually leave a pretty generous search radius because a lot of the positions in the old catalogs are very bad. <laughs> um, or if they're x-ray sources, they maybe um, the, the positions can be off by tens of arc seconds. And you want to look at the astrometry of the star, Gaia BR2, the Hipparchus catalog, some of the recent ground-based catalogs. Uh, get a handle on the photometry, the near-infrared photometry, thermal infrared photometry, some of the compendia of optical photometry. Um, somebody's probably measured spectral type for it. Great sanity check before you do anything else, okay? You'll get a sense of whether the star is red or not when you compare the colors to the actual spectral type of the star. There's now compendia of, of uh, metallicities from different surveys. Uh, look at the space velocity of the star. High velocity stars tend to be older. Low velocity stars, you got to do your homework. It could be an old low velocity star. It could be a young high velocity star, a uh, young low velocity star. Um, and look for compilations of activity indicators, rotation. Look for evidence and membership in, uh, either to a stellar multiple or to a stellar group. Um, am I into the question period right now? Okay, so um, anyway, so I will, I'm just going to move forward through these here. Um, but this is just some of the things I look at, just trying to get a handle on the age of the star. This is just a list of some, some useful papers uh, on uh, some of the stellar uh, age indicators. Um, and uh, also look at this recent work, just to putting, if, if you're quoting stellar values, uh, stellar radii luminosities, I encourage you to look at the, the IU resolutions we just had passed a few years ago. Just, we, there's a nominal set of solar uh, units now. There's now a single uh, stellar volumetric magnitude scale. Um, so just to make sure your, your numbers are quoted on a, um, an international standard. Um, and this is just some on, other online uh, resources here. Um, for the stellar evolutionary tracks, I'd especially like to point you to the, whoops, to the, uh, uh, the, the missed tracks from, from the MESA group. Um, uh, these are now housed at Harvard with this very nice set of dense um, uh, isochrones uh, from the, uh, the, the MESA project. And uh, I've been using those as of late. Um, and I'll just leave up this list of general advice here. So I'll open up the questions for my remaining time. Thank you. I, I should say a reliable, okay. That's a good photo. So the, the, the question was, you showed TRAPPIST-1, and the best age indicator we had for TRAPPIST-1 was a kinematic age, and then later I said, the kinematic age is stink. Uh, yes. So that, that was, uh, the kinematic ages that were quoted in the table are actually expansion ages for young groups. So the kinematic age we quoted for TRAPPIST-1, this was based on the distribution of ages for stars with similar velocities to TRAPPIST-1. If you look at the, it's a, it's a high velocity star, if you look at its position in velocity space and you compare it to the ages of other stars with similar velocities, nowhere near the local standard rest, they tend to be old thick disk and, uh, and sorry, thick disk and old thin disk stars. They tend to be sort of, you know, six, seven, eight, nine giga years. Um, and you saw the error bars are fairly atrocious. You're probably not going to do much better than that with a, a kinematic age for a field star. Um, so I did not, yeah, the, the table from Soderbergh did not list the, the, uh, that, that type of age. If anybody has a better age for Trappist 1, please tell me. Yep, that's a very good point. Those are, those are mostly single stars. So the, the question was, with, with the decay of chromospheric activity with age, what about you know, pathological cases? What about close-in binaries, close-in planets? Close-in planets, I don't think are really, there's, there's, been, there's been some papers the last few years where there might be some cases where that's affecting it. Okay, hot Jupiters are like 1% of field stars. They're irrelevant, okay? 
for the uh, for chromospherically active binaries, that is an issue. Okay, so tiny fraction of local stars are chromospherically active binaries. You've got two sunlight stars, and for a period of less than about 10 days, those stars tend to tidally lock, and they stay fast rotating throughout the main sequence lifetime and off the main sequence. They turn into RF CBN. Okay, so those tend to be saturated X-ray emitters, very strong chromospherically active stars, but they stand out really strongly. Uh, you, you can, first off, they're rare, and you'll know it's an RF. There's other indicators that, that it'll be an RF CBN. They'll tend to be, um, uh, you'll tend to see very, stars where, you know, their HR diagram position, the star may look kinematically old, evolved off the main sequence, and yet still be a saturated X-ray emitter. Um, we had a, I'll tell you one funny case. We had a pathological star we found about seven or eight years ago. This was Eric Fubar, who was a postdoc at Rochester. We found a star that we thought was a runaway Tutori star. We had a star that was a saturated X-ray emitter, fast rotating, short rotation period, lithium rich, but it was moving at about 100 or 200 kilometers a second through the solar neighborhood. What the heck is going on? We thought maybe this thing was ejected from a young cluster. It turned out to be a, a halo RFCBN system. It was lithium rich because it was higher mass. It used to be an F star when it was on the main sequence and never burned its lithium. And it was really probably about an 11 gig year old star. But you can have multiple indicators. You, you don't want to just look at one or two indicators. They may give you a wrong answer. But, but, but after looking at multiple indicators, we concluded it was just it was a halo, chromospherically active binary star. There's several indicators that were kind of treating this place. So every star is a pathology, so it's close enough. <laughs> Let's thank Eric again. Thank you.